नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू सेशन एट इन अवर कोर्स ऑन ऑपरेशन मैनेजमेंट सो करंटली वी आर इन द वीक टू ऑफ अवर कोर्स ऑन ऑपरेशन मैनेजमेंट एंड इन वीक टू अवर मेजर फोकस एरिया इज प्रोडक्ट डिजाइन एंड डेवलपमेंट सो वी आर नॉट going through the run of the mill type of sessions on product design and development because there is lot of literature lot of good books available on product design and the steps have been outlined in a very very clear and precise manner so all of us know that when we have to design a product what we must take care of or what are the steps that we must follow but we are trying to acquaint ourselves with the tools that may help us during the product design process so within the broad gambit of operations management we have seen in week 1 what operation management is what are the functions and scopes and strategies of operations management then we focused on what we should make in order to make our organization or our factory or our enterprise successful what means what product we must make and there we have seen that in product design and development we are able to identify the products that will that may make us successful now in week 2 our focus broadly from operations management point of view is that what we should make to be successful in the market within product design and development if we see we are going to have five sessions in first session we discussed about product life cycle so what we could what can be the take home point from that product life cycle session we have seen that how the sales vary over the lifetime of the product how the profits vary over the lifetime of the product so we were able to establish that no there is no product which can continue on and on and on and on there has to be a period when the sales or the profits of the product will start to decline and as soon as the sales or the profits start to decline the company either has to come up with a improvised version of the product or has to come up with a completely new product first session gave us this i think understanding that product design has to be done regularly by every organization either to sustain in the market or to capture additional market share so product design is important which was established by the product life cycle session in second session we focused our attention on value engineering that once we have decided that we are going to come up with a improvised version of our product or we are going to come up with a completely new product what we need to do we will try to understand the needs and wants or the requirements of the customer we will try to see what are the functions the customer wants from our product we will focus on those functions we will identify those functions we will break down those functions into individual functions of the components and then we will try to achieve those functions at the minimum possible cost either by redesigning the product or by changing the material of the product or by changing the manufacturing processes that are used to fabricate or manufacture that product once we have made our design we have finalized our design then we will go to the next stage that is we have to look for the manufacturability we have to look for the assembly of the various components into the product so we have already conceptualized our product but during that design stage only we have to see that how this product will be manufactured how this product would be assembled and for that we need to understand a completely new aspect that is design for x now x here is variable and may depend upon the particular situation or environment where we are going to use this concept there is a term called design for manufacturing and assembly where there are guidelines that if we follow those guidelines we will come up with a product which is definitely going to be successful in the market if we follow these guidelines 
but still there are failures of the products. The failure may not be because of the DFMA guidelines, but because of the design that we have made or we may not have been able to address all the needs, requirements, wants of the customer. So, if the product is not accepted by the market, not accepted by the customers, the guidelines may not be blamed for that reason. The reason can be that the mapping between the wants and the functions that the designer has designed into the product is not accurate, the mapping is incorrect. So, today in our session, we will try to understand that once the functions have been identified, uh, conceptual design has been proposed, what are the other guidelines, rules, regulations that we must follow during the design process, so that our design is successful and we are going to understand this important aspect of design for X. Many times you will hear the word design for manufacturing, design for assembly. So, all these are subsets of the concept of design for X and that we are going to cover in today's session. Then once we understand the design for X, there is another important aspect that is ergonomics because every product mostly will be used by human beings. So, this man-machine interaction also has to be taken into account and we have to take into account the concept of ergonomics also during the design process of a product. So, we will see in the next session the concept of ergonomics. So, let us today try to understand the concept of design for X and we will just rush through the presentation and see with examples that how this can be helpful to us or to the product designers. So, on your screen you have a very fundamental definition for design for excellence or design for X. So, design for excellence or DFX is a systematic design approach that entails wide range of guidelines and standards. Now, this is a design approach which is comprising of or which incorporates a long list of guidelines. Now, guidelines can be the you can say rules of thumb which can help us in easy manufacturing of our product. These can be guidelines which can help us for ensuring the easy assembly of the various components into the final product. So, DFX is something which is systematic in nature and it entails guidelines and standards which optimize the product realization life cycle. Now, we have seen from the product life cycle, we have seen that new products are the need of the hour. Every company comes up with innovative and creative products with passage of time, if they want to sustain in the market or if they want to build themselves in the market. So, new product design is inevitable for every company which is well established. Then value engineering concepts help us to map the functions that the customer want with the product design. Now, once our concept is ready, we take into account these guidelines, we take into account these standards which help us in further fine tuning our conceptual design into a tangible design which can then be sent for manufacturing. So, during the design process we must take into account all these guidelines. So, in reality the term DFX is better thought of as design for X where the variable X is interchangeable with one of the many values depending upon the particular object objectives of the venture. Now, objectives of the venture can be that there can be a product which is maybe which has five different sub components or sub assemblies. Now, these sub assemblies have to be assembled together in the form of a tangible product. Now, the X here can be assembly that we have to follow the guidelines already established for design for assembly and we have to develop the assembly sequence in such a way that it is easy to assemble these five sub components together. It may take minimum time, minimum cost, minimum effort to ensure the assembly of the five sub components into the final product. So, X will take the 
we can say value assembly there. So, the, our guidelines which guidelines we have to follow, we have to follow design for assembly guidelines. So, we will see one case study today and try to understand the DFA, how DFA is beneficial to us. Now, these guidelines whatever design for manufacturability, design for assembly guidelines ensures the issues related to manufacturing, cost, quality, assembly and serviceability are addressed at the design stage only. Why I am emphasizing on design stage only? Because the most of the cost associated with the product is locked. L O C K E D logged at the design stage only. So, we should follow, we must follow all these guidelines at the design stage to ensure that our product is of good quality, our product is easy to manufacture, our product is easy to assemble, our product is easy to service. So, if we follow all these guidelines at the design stage only, we are ensuring the success of our product in the long run. So, if these guidelines are not adhered, then what is going to happen? So, if we do not follow these guidelines, it can lead to engineering changes occurring at later stages of the product life cycle. The later stages can be during the manufacturing of the product, which are highly expensive and can cause product delays and cost overruns. Very simple examples of this Sim point can be making up of a building or construction of a house. So, we architect has designed the house. During the design, many things have been overlooked. Now, you make the foundation and you erect the walls and you lay the roof and you do the plastering and later stage if you identify that oh, this thing is missing, we must have incorporated this thing what you need to do? You need to change the complete thing physically. But at the design stage only, if you find out that yes, this thing is missing, this thing can be incorporated in the building. In the design stage only, on your system, you have to only make changes. Only the CAD file or the soft file only or the computer based file only you need to change. You need not physically demolish walls or maybe roof of the house to make the changes. Therefore, if we follow all these guidelines at early stage of the product life cycle, that is during the design stage, our life becomes much easier during the manufacturing phase. Why? Because everything is logged at the design stage and if we have followed all the guidelines, we need not make any changes towards the manufacturing stage of the product life cycle. So, it is important again and again I am emphasizing that there can be a question somebody may ask you that when we must follow these guidelines of DFA, DFM, DFMA, DFQ, immediately you must be able to answer that we must follow these guidelines during the design stage of the product. Now, some of the common substitutes for X I have already in the previous slide highlighted that DF X, X can be a variable in which X can take different values. So, some examples are given here design for manufacturing, design for assembly. So, X can be manufacturing, X can be assembly, X can be manufacturability and assembly, X can be production, even X can be quality also, X can be safety also. So, on the right hand side you can see a figure DFX, design for manufacturing, design for production, design for cost, design for service, design for safety, similarly design for reliability, design for assembly. So, X can take any value. So, we must ensure that when we are designing a particular product, we must follow these guidelines religiously and judiciously. Otherwise, what is going to happen? In most of the companies, there is a design center or a design cell. There is a manufacturing plant. Now, the design center can be in city A, manufacturing plant can be in city B. Now, the design people without having much knowledge about the manufacturing versatility or the manufacturing uh, ability of a company, they will design the product. Now, the design will be sent to the manufacturing plant. 
and there may be iterations in the design based on the availability of machines in the manufacturing plant and that may lead to time wastage. So, these days this DFM, DFA concepts are very, very helpful and a product team or a project team is appointed which has different members. Now, members can be definitely from the design stage, design uh, team means people will be from the design, people will be from the manufacturing, experts of manufacturing will always be there in the product design team or product development team as per the basic principles of DFM and DFA. Then there will be people from the legal department, there will be people from the sales department, there will be people from the marketing department, there will be people from the finance department. So, a complete multifunctional product team will be formed or will be constituted to take this product from the conceptualization stage to the final launch in the market. And there the concept of DFM, DFA will be well adapted. Why? Because as soon as the designer will come up with a suppose a particular shape of a product, the manufacturing expert who is there in that product team will be easily able to establish there or will be easily able to tell at that point of time that whether the company has that particular capability to make that shape or whether some design changes are required in the shape to map or to match with the manufacturing facilities available with the company. So, this will save a lot of time and this is the basic fundamental concept of DFX that is design for manufacturing or design for assembly. So, at design stage only we will take into account all these aspects. The aspect of safety is also uh, covered during the design stage only. Now, let us take two examples. Now, example number one is design for manufacturing. Now, DFM is the method of design for ease of manufacturing. Ease of manufacturing means that once we are, we have uh, conceptualized our idea, we need to take into account that once this product will go to the shop floor, once this product will go to the factory, it should be easy to manufacture this product. It should not be too complicated a product that it is difficult to produce it or difficult to manufacture it. So, DFM will ensure the ease of manufacturing of the collection of parts that will form the product after assembly. So, further it goes one level down. So, we are saying ease of manufacturing of the product. For example, the camera that is recording this lecture. There are so many parts, components, small parts that I can see in this camera. Ease of manufacturing says that the different parts that have been assembled to make this structure or make this camera must be easy to manufacture. There may be probably I can just make a wild guess that may be more than 50 to 60 parts that have been used to assemble this camera. So, ease of manufacturing means or design for manufacturing means that each and every part should be easy to manufacture. And what should be our objective? Our objective is to minimize the manufacturing costs. So, that is one broad bottom line that we have to ensure that the cost of the product or cost of the individual component is minimized. So, what we have what is our focus? Optimization of the manufacturing process at the design stage only. We are not going to first design and then on the shop floor we are not optimizing the process, we are optimizing it during the design stage only. So, that is the beauty of this concept of design for manufacturing. Now, design for manufacturing is a development practice. So, during the design only we have to take into account these guidelines, emphasizing manufacturing issues throughout the product development process. Usually, this used to happen towards the end of the product development process, but now with the invention or with the development of concepts like DFM and DFA, this is, this has become a routine or this has become a 
you can say long process or a continuous process I must say not a long I must say a continuous process from the conceptualization of the idea to the final launch in the market the manufacturing concepts have to be considered or the manufacturing issues have to be considered. Successful DFM results in lower production cost without sacrificing the product quality. So, we can say we have studied in the last session value engineering. In value engineering also we are not compromising the quality, but we are still focusing on minimizing the cost. So, here also our focus is to minimize the production cost without sacrificing the quality. So, the concepts are overlapping. Here also we are doing value engineering. So, this is just a uh, overview of what the manufacturing system is overall made up of. Our target is the red color here, the finished goods. What are the various inputs, raw materials, labor, purchased components for sub assemblies, equipment, information, tooling, energy, supplies, services and then sometimes we have some rejected parts that go as waste. So, our final product are the finished goods only. So, we have to focus on each and every element, each and every component of this system in order to overall optimize the manufacturing process. Now, in DFM method we can see here there is a proposed design which already has taken into account the concepts of value engineering, it is satisfying all the functions as specified by the customer. So, we have a input that is a product design or a concept design. We will see as per DFM what are the manufacturing costs. So, in the previous slide we have seen that the manufacturing system is made up of so many inputs. So, we will establish the manufacturing cost based on all these things raw material, labor, information, tooling, services and uh, electricity and other part other things whatever was mentioned in the previous slide. So, we will estimate the manufacturing cost. Now, that is our benchmark that for this design this is the cost. Then we apply the guidelines of DFM. So, we will see we will try to reduce the costs of the components as I have given an example of this camera. We will focus on reducing the cost of the individual components, but without sacrificing the quality. So, we will try to reduce the cost of the component. We may in some cases combine the two parts together. So, they can achieve all the functions for which there were two parts earlier. Now, we can combine them into a single part and then we can redesign that part in such a way that the cost is reduced, but the quality is not sacrificed. Similarly, we can reduce the costs of assembly. So, if we are combining the two parts together achieving the desired function without sacrificing the quality, we are saving one assembly operation. So, we can reduce the costs of assembly. Similarly, we can reduce the costs of supporting production. So, we will focus on all these areas and then we will consider the impact of DFM decisions on other factors. So, these three steps we will follow one step, second step or these three things we will follow as per the guidelines of DFM. And finally, we will see what impact these guidelines has on the cost. So, consider the impact of DFM decisions on the other factor, recompute the manufacturing cost. So, other factors can be the overall look of the suppose we are minimizing some parts, we are combining certain functions. So, how the product is looking now? what is the effect on the safety, what is the effect on the aesthetics of the product, what is the effect on the legal aspects of the product. So, we will see what these changes, how these changes are affecting the other factors. So, if there is not much change in the other factors, we will recompute the manufacturing cost. And if it is good enough, we will say okay, we can accept the design, modified design as per the guidelines of DFM. But suppose we feel that no, there are certain issues, there are certain safety issues related to the redesign, we will go and go back and we will follow the iterative process of design until and unless we are satisfied that our new design is giving us 
all the functions, it is satisfying the design requirements, the specification at a lower cost. So, we will say okay, let us now fix the or let us now freeze the final design. Now, this is an example, very simple example we have taken. So, I will just read it for you. In a sheet metal design, specifying hole sizes, locations and their alignment is critical. So, we can see here, there are holes in this sheet metal. It is always better to specify hole diameters that are greater than the sheet's thickness T. So, it is always better that the diameter should be greater than the sheet's thickness. Spacing between two holes also is important. It should be at least two times the sheet thickness if not more. So, the spacing between the two holes is also important. Distance between the holes ensures strength of the metal and prevents holes from, from deforming during the bending of bending or forming processes. These are the design for manufacturing guidelines, DFM guidelines for sheet metal with or the design of the sheet metal with holes. So, once you need to have holes in the sheet metal, it is always better, it is always judicious to follow these guidelines in order to make a good design. So, these guidelines will be considered during the design stage of the product development cycle. Now, coming on to design for assembly, let us have a quick discussion on DFA. DFA is a method of design of the product for ease of assembly. So, I am not going to explain DFM ease of manufacturing, DFA ease of assembly, optimization of the part or system assembly. Now, DFA is a tool used to assist the design teams in the design of products that will transition to production at a minimum cost focusing on the number of parts, handling and ease of assembly. Now, three things are important here. First is what is the total number of parts. So, as per DFA design for assembly, we will focus on reducing the number of parts in the product. How to handle these parts? It should be easy to handle and finally, they should be easy to assemble. So, these are the three things that we have to take into account. First thing is number of parts should be less. These parts should be easy to handle while assembling and the assembly operations should themselves be simpler. Now, this is design for assembly principles. Quickly, I will read. I have already highlighted some of them. Minimize the part count. Number of parts should be less. Design parts with self-locating features. So, parts should be so designed that they locate one above the other easily. Design parts with self-fastening features. So, self-fastening uh, concept should also be there. Minimize reorientation of parts during assembly. So, we must avoid the reorientation of parts. Design parts for retrieval, handling and insertion. Emphasize top down assemblies. So, top down assembly means that the heaviest part we should keep at the bottom and on that we should assemble the smaller parts. So, standardized parts, minimum use of fasteners should be ensured. Encourage modular design which is again we can say is related to the first point that is minimize the part count. So, number of parts should be less, modular design must be ensured. For example, one example can be three wires going independently into a electric switch or the other thing can be three wires fixed into a one modular design and only one one we can say switch is being fixed. So, that is the kind of modular design that we need to uh, use the concept of modularity in the design. Design for a base part to locate the other component which is again related to the top down assembly approach. Design for component symmetry for insertion. If two parts have to be joined together, we must ensure that uh, orientation should be such that there is symmetry and the two parts can be combined together easily. So, these are design guidelines. Since we have paucity of time, 
you can just go through these guidelines and search for DFA, you will get so many good examples in which you will see that this is a modular design, this is not a modular design, this is a poor design, this is a good design, this is a top down approach design related to top down approach, this is not related to top down approach, this is poor assembly operation, this is good assembly operation. So, all these points must be taken into account when we are designing the product that when the different parts will be assembled together, these guidelines if we are following our assembly will become very very easy and therefore, we can easily say that after following the DFA or design for assembly guideline, the assembly was easier. Let us take very quickly one example and then we will wind up the today's session. This is one uh, sources Boothroyd, Dustrust and Neat, Knight, Dewhurst and Knight sorry. So, this is a good book on product design design for manufacturing and assembly guidelines are given. So, this is Boothroyd, Dewhurst and Knight's book. So, the example has been taken from there. So, the original design for a thermal gun sight reticle in a US tank made by Texas Instrumenting. There are large number of fasteners here we can see. Redesigned thermal gun sight reticle simpler to assemble and less to go wrong. So, you can see the previous again there are number of fasteners designed here and this is a redesign, it is going the redesigned part or the product is going to achieve the desired function as was being done by the previous design. But here you see far less number of fasteners and the parts have been redesigned in such a way that they are easy to assemble. Now, what are the advantages or improvements noted? Assembly time improvement is 84 percent, number of different parts original design had 24 parts, redesigned part has only 8 sub components. Total number of parts were 47 and in redesign there are only 12 number of parts. So, some of you may be wondering number of different parts and total number of parts, how they are different. So, different parts means 24 different designs are there and total number of parts can be 47, maybe there are uh, there is a type of a uh, fastener which is four fasteners of same type are used. Therefore, the total number of parts are more because different parts are 20, 24, but total number of parts are 47, but they have been reduced finally to 12. So, total number of operations are also reduced because there are less number of parts to be assembled from original 58 operations. Now, redesigned part has only 30 operation, 13 sorry, 1, 3 operation. So, that is basically you can see that if you apply the design for assembly guidelines, you get lot of improvements which saves your time as well as effort without compromising or without sacrificing the functionality of the product design. So, with this we come to the end of today's session and if you have, if you will go through this session again, if you go through those guidelines, definitely you will get certain examples in various books, where you will be better able to appreciate the concept of design for manufacturing and assembly. In our next session, we will focus on the concept of ergonomics and how ergonomics can help us to design a better product. Thank you.